So today for a premium car, a LIDAR is about $1,000 and I think it still meets the, the market demand. Uh, but if you want to go into a lower grade, the LIDAR needs to be much cheaper, right? So we all know that uh, at, the, at the really high adoption of LIDARs, it will need to be at $100 or, or even less. Do self-driving cars need LIDAR? Elon Musk says no way. Most other experts say probably. We're going to talk to one of them today. His name is Omar Khilaf, and he's the founder and CEO of Innoviz, who supplies LiDAR and other technology for BMW and many other manufacturers. In an era, of course, when LiDAR is getting so cheap, we can have it in our phones. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you for inviting me here. Looking forward to this conversation. Let's start right here. Do we need LiDAR to make self-driving cars safe? If so, why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, an autonomous car is driven by a computer and you can't allow it to have a single point of failure, right? So, you know, a, a drop of water can blur a camera and then the computer cannot understand the scene. Today, uh, you have a passenger which is holding a wheel and taking over if something wrong happens. But you, if you want to really fully disengage, you need to add another sensor uh, that is not degraded in the same way that cameras are, uh, that can actually provide redundancy. Today, the only sensor that can provide it is, is a LiDAR. So if you want to get to autonomous driving, you have to use a LiDAR. Big elephant in the room, Elon Musk and Tesla um, mm -hmm. have been uh, <laughs> hardcore, let's put it that way, that LiDAR <laughs> is unnecessary. It's almost a religious position, it seems, in some yeah. ways, shape or form. Why? Yeah, I mean, five years ago, when he had to make a decision on a car that he brings to the market, there was no LiDAR that was available at the right price point and performance and maturity. So he made a good decision. Um, I think the reality has changed. I think that the people realize that LiDARs uh, are able to reach the relevant price point and performance. And basically, I, I believe eventually he would make the right decision if he wants to go to level three. So we'll get into some of the costs and cost curves and where it's going, where it's trended uh, in a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about how much better LiDAR is. You mentioned already that it doesn't get blinded by a drop of water or some mud on the sensor or something like that that might come up from the road. How much better is LiDAR? What's the resolution, the range, those sorts of things than visual? Yeah, so um, range and resolution are calculated by the speed of the car that you need. You want to drive autonomously. The faster very the car fast. drives. Very, very fast. <laughs> yeah. So for, uh, for example, when a car drives at 130 kilometers an hour, it has a certain time it needs to slow down, right? So you can actually calculate uh, the range which you need to see. So about 200 meters is kind of the, the figure uh, of merit in that. Uh, and you need to have very high resolution because you want to be able to see an object which is at least one third of the tire because that's an object that can actually make a car turn over. Mm -hmm. So the resolution is quite high. It's 0.1 or even higher than that. Um, and you need to have uh, first a uh, high frame rate in order to react faster and wide field of view in order to capture different driving scenarios such as incline or decline or turns, etc. Uh, so, and, you know, cameras can, can achieve quite well in, in seeing objects as long as they see. <laughs> and when they don't, uh, there is no other sensor that can reach that. Even the most Advanced radars that are in discussion today are far below the needed resolution. So mm. it's, uh, it's only LiDARs. Okay. Now you're working with BMW. You're installing them, your LiDARs in their mm -hmm. cars. Uh, what are they using it for and, and how's that project going? Yeah, sure. So th this is our product. As you can see, it's, it's very, very small. Uh, this is Innovis One. It's a solid state this, uh, LiDAR. It's mounted in, in, the, car, in the car grill in order to uh, provide uh, that redundancy information, also including object detection and classification. So we're not only providing the, the raw 3D information, we also provide the insights, meaning that we translate the, the raw data into cars, pedestrians, motorcycles, um, and that gives uh, redundancy to the overall system. Uh, the project mm -hmm. is uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, being part of such a program is, is a big honor for us. 
Uh, BMW is one of the most, uh, I would say, advanced car makers in regards to the technology. And uh, we're very proud to be picked for that. So let's talk about those cost curves that you mentioned earlier. I remember when LiDAR sensors were thousands of dollars. I, I, I even want to say tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, and now, of course, you're getting them in smartphones. Um, you're getting them in smaller devices. Talk to me about the evolution there and where the cost curves have come and where they're going. Yeah, I mean, um, traditionally, whenever a new technology is introduced to the market, uh, those are mostly adopted by the premium cars because they, they have sufficient volume but uh, can absorb a certain cost. So today for a premium car, a LiDAR is about $1,000 and I think it still meets the, the market demand. Uh, but if you want to go into a lower grade, the LiDAR needs to be much cheaper, right? So we all know that uh, at, the, at the really high adoption of LiDARs, it will need to be at $100 or, or even less. Um, I think that in the next uh, five or seven years, probably the trend would go through uh, $500 and then $300. And this is where we are targeting our, our next generation, Inuvis 2. Mm -hmm. give you a, an interesting insight. You know, five years ago, um, there was a, a big discussion whether you use uh, stereo cameras or mono cameras, right? And uh, Mobileye has proven the world that even saving uh, tens of dollars, right? The difference between two cameras and one is only 10 or $20 can be compensated by a very strong uh, IP. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, the push for lower cost LIDARs would be very, very harsh. I think that using uh, our kind of technology is the right way to get there. So what are you using? Are you using multiple cameras or one? We're using one. Okay. <laughs> in, in, in that benchmark, we're using one. I mean, there is a dispute in the light of space between using 1550 nanometer and 905 nanometer. Uh, we are on the 905 uh, camp because that's allowing us to use very low cost components. And we are able to solve uh, performance limitations of 905 by very strong IP that we developed. Okay. So we're talking self-driving cars. Obviously, you're talking BMW, one of your customers. Uh, those are one application of using LiDAR, one application of autonomy, frankly, for machines or even, you know, cars, uh, other types of transportation. How else and where else do you see it being used? Hmm, many. So, you know, there, there are different application verticals, you would say, uh, for LiDARs. One of them is, is shuttles. Okay, so those are urban creatures that uh, like to travel in a predetermined route. And, and there is a lack of, uh, of drivers also in trucks. Uh, so the need, the use of lighters can actually quite uh, be beneficial in order to improve the transportation as a whole. Uh, so trucks, shuttles, of course, also there are other industrial, uh, you know, applications that would like to automate. I mean, anything you would like to automate uh, would like to have 3D sensing because it gives you a very good understanding of, of the scene uh, and would be able to, to be enabled by, by a LiDAR. I think a LiDAR has a very strong benefit, which gives you a very good understanding of the scene for very different types of uh, objects. You know, a camera is, is mostly relying on the fact that you are able to train the system to identify what it is in order to interact with it. Mm -hmm. uh, a LiDAR is, is actually a physical sensor. You, you, you send a pulse of light and you measure a reflection, a light reflection from an object, so you, you basically can see it. So uh, you know where it is, you know what's the size of it, even if you don't exactly know what it is. I always talk about the example of a person uh, pushing a piano into the road. Uh, that might happen, right? I mean, if you didn't train your camera to understand what is that object now pushed to the, to the road, not sure how would you react to it. And with a LiDAR, you know, you, you basically see where it is, you see how, like, how large it is, how far you are with it, and you, you know how to you know, walk around it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not only about making it safer, it's actually you know, also providing a lot of uh, insights that are missing from, from a camera. And the, and the processing power that you need to add in order to understand the scene is going to be much lower. So Apple is rumored to be entering the self-driving car market, perhaps 2024, uh, and they've, they're talking about using LiDAR as well, from what we hear. Uh, how do you see rumors of that impacting your industry, the car industry? And, and if that turns out to be true, 
what do you think the impact will be? I think it's quite uh, good, obviously. It's quite clear why Apple has an interest to go in that direction. Uh, Tesla has showed the world that, uh, you know, being a very technology company allows them to be, you know, the most evaluated, you know, company uh, in the world. I mean, and it's not come because they're selling more cars than others. I think it's because of the fact that people believe that eventually they will gain more and more market share because of their technology lead. Apple is a very strong technology player and they most likely would be a very strong player in the market if they decide to participate. And I think it's a smart move. Uh, I think it helps also for us as a supplier in the automotive space that pushes technology to be uh, to get more interest from car companies that want to be in the game, mm-hmm. want to be more technology oriented um, and, and get faster to, you know, to technology. It's going to be so interesting. Um, obviously, there's talk about partnering. There were talk about some Japanese partners as well that seem to fall through. And, and I'm not going to ask you to speculate on that. Obviously, you've got uh, partnerships and interests in the industry as well. But uh, Apple has a big war chest and it can make a lot of things happen, whether it goes on its own, whether it partners, whether it actually purchases a full on existing automotive manufacturer right now as well. In terms of LiDAR and in terms of devices that a vehicle has to sense its environment, how many should a vehicle have? So it depends on the application. For level two plus or level three, uh, which is an autonomous car, but mostly on highway or traffic jams, it's basically one sensor, one one front looking sensor, uh, obviously with sufficient field of view, okay, but it's it's front, uh, front looking. Uh, once you go into an urban scenario, like a shuttle or a robot taxi, you need to have uh, 360, meaning that you need several lidars around the car. I think that in, in shuttles, you might need even more because, and I think that uh, using a lidar such as ours has a quite interesting value because, um, you know, shuttles are usually very long vehicles, yes. very tall. So if you add a spinner to the roof, it will most likely meet like the roof from the top and will have a very huge blind spot around the vehicle. Uh, so that's not very helpful. Uh, so you, anyway, you need multiple sensors, even if they are uh, 360, and that's not very efficient and quite expensive. So having a LiDAR like ours, which is very small and you can embed at the surround on the vehicle and you can place them lower, gives you uh, the benefit of using uh, a lower cost, automotive grade and short range and long range. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a very interesting market for us. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So Tech First is about tech that's changing the world and innovators who are shaping the future. Uh, Where do you think the future of machines and perception is? Uh, How do you see that evolving over the next five to 10 years? (laughs) I I believe it's going to be growing very fast. I think that uh, once the we all see that there are two trends that are supporting that kind of um, you know application. One is the processing power, and the second is the sensors. And you know, I'm also amazed by the the pace that we are able to achieve. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with um, this two, which will be released later in the year, it's going to be a product that is going to be mind blowing, and uh, it's it's quite amazing to see how technology can run so fast. And you know, to, to your point earlier about Elon Musk, uh, which is very religious about lidars, you know, I always say that you know, it's I don't really understand why people would be religious on technology. They they tend to change so fast. Um, I think that uh, you know they they change faster than we can you know realize. Uh, and I, I you know obviously while we're talking about also quantum computing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's 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 really going to be quite amazing. You know, it's funny. You, you, I don't know if you know, but in automotive, there is a lot of work on, on cybersecurity, and mm-hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we need to meet with is with the chance that in the next fifteen years, uh, quantum computers would be available to to attack, uh, you know, cybersecurity. Yes. So you need to prove that your cybersecurity today. Uh, is going to be strong enough for the next 15 years. 
think about that as a challenge. <laughs> it's a real challenge. And of course, you can update over the air, but uh, the hardware is not so easy to update. Uh, and we see that coming very soon, right? I mean, Teslas are already uh, in, in an unreleased version, talking to each other, telling each other what's up ahead on the road, uh, prepping to um, go in caravan together, right? So they, they break the, the, the wind and, and, and you are 20% more efficient uh, battery efficient, I should say, rather than fuel efficient at, at, mm -hmm. at traveling. So it's super interesting. So you're releasing uh, version two uh, later this year. Where do you see your technology in, in let's say, a decade? Uh, is it too small to see? <laughs> is it tiny? <laughs> is it invisible in the car? Perhaps ubiquitous? Ten little pods around the car that you don't even notice? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think that, you know, it's clear that th there are two ways to solve it. One is that you... You need to have a sensor which is uh, cheap enough that you can embed in any car and, and actually multiple of those. Um, and then there's the infrastructure. So I don't know which one of them would come faster. I, I assume that the, the earlier one, because uh, you know even when the, the infrastructure is going to be available, it will have its own limitations. I believe that uh, you know lighters would be very much smaller and much cheaper, like a sub $100 and even lower than that. And I have no doubt that we will get there. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, sure. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.